Okay, so welcome uh, everyone to uh, the second Maxmin conference, Mathematics and Computer Science for Materials Innovation. So this is a very interdisciplinary event between communities of mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, crystallographers, chemists, computational chemists, and our first speaker, uh, Phil Smith, uh, well, uh, sort of a face of our group will be uh, representing starting this meeting uh, with a talk on high index Voronoi zones. Over to you, Phil, please. Thank you very much, Vitaly. And um, thank you very much for organizing this conference. I'm very much looking forward to um, the rest of the talks. So I'm going to be talking about, yes, higher index Voronoi zones of periodic point sets. Um, and this is work I've done under the supervision of Vitaly um, and was part of my PhD that I did um, through the Levitine Research Center for Functional Materials Design. Um, yeah, as Vitaly said, if you do have any questions at any point, do feel free to um, just interrupt me. That's absolutely fine. Um, let me try and explain this title briefly. So um, periodic point sets is what we use to model crystals, which is um, something that as a group we're particularly interested in. Um, specifically, we want to um, uh, classify crystals up to isometries. Um, and we do that by um, defining uh, uh, crystal invariants. And um, these higher index Voronoi zones are a geometric concept that um, are used in the computations of, of one of these such crystal invariants. Um, hopefully you're now seeing my second slide. So as I said, we use um, periodic point sets to model crystals. Um, for us, a crystal is a solid uh, periodic structure um, that is invariant under translations um, in three independent directions. And it's usually described by uh, the content of a unit cell. So here's a a typical, um, a kind of typical crystal on the left. And we want to model that as a um, formal mathematical object. And we use um, periodic point sets to do that. Um, so this is quite crucial to my talk. So let me um, explain this. So to get a periodic point set, um, you're going to start with um, if you're in n dimensions, you're going to start with n linearly independent vectors called your basis vectors. Um, so in this image, we've got e1 and e2. And if we take uh, integer combinations of these basis vectors, we're going to get a lattice, which are, are these black dots. Um, here, we will usually denote that by a capital lambda. If we um, half as our coefficients of our basis vectors, the interval from zero to one, we get a unit cell, um, which is this uh, bluey turquoise region. And then if we take a finite subset of our unit cell, for example, these five, these are meant to be zero dimensional, <coughs> excuse me, zero dimensional dots. That is what we call a motif of our unit cell. So, um, you could think of these as being uh, atoms or molecules that form a crystal. And it is by translating um, our motif by the um, lattice vectors that we get our periodic point set. So on the right here would be a, a snippet of our periodic point set. You can imagine uh, this five point motif um, translating to fill the entire plane. Um, and we could use this, particularly in three dimensions, to model um, crystals. And e even though both, um, <coughs> excuse me, both composition and arrangement um, of crystals can be varied um, to produce a rich space, um, periodic point sets are a good way of modeling them. Um, at the moment, um, in the work we've been doing, we've not been distinguishing between different atoms. Um, so all atoms have the same label, but it's something where for future work, we do think we could um, add label, labels to our points in our periodic sets. Um, so I just briefly explain, explain the 
the formal problem that we as a group are trying to solve. Um, and that is we're particularly interested in finding a continuous, complete isometry classification of crystals. So that means that we desire a fingerprint function um, from the space of crystals um, to a simpler space. For example, Rn, so a list of numbers a bit like um, maybe a barcode. And for this to be a useful function, um, we think it should satisfy three um, criteria. Namely, it should be invariant under isometries of R3. So that means if we rotate our crystal, if we um, reflect it or translate it, the um, our sort of barcode, our fingerprint is not going to change. We need it to be stable with respect to per perturbations, which means that if we slightly change um, atomic coordinates in our crystal, then our list of numbers are invariants are only going to slightly change themselves. And um, this is quite a tough property to get, but um, we want to be ambitious. Um, we would like our um, invariants to be complete, which means that um, non-isometric crystals or pyramidic point sets uh, need to map to different fingerprints um, as a way of distinguishing non non-similar crystals. So that's, this is our formal problem that we as a, um, a group are trying to solve. And you probably um, see, uh, I think, a few ways that our group have been approaching this problem um, in subsequent talks. Um, there we go. Um, I'm just quickly going to explain a way um, I've been approaching this problem. That's something that we call density functions. And hopefully, um, I'm using the example of the square lattice in two dimensions to explain this. Um, so hopefully that would be helpful to help you uh, understand it. And how density functions work is we take our periodic point set, but I'm just, I'm using a lattice here for simplicity. And we uh, grow uh, balls around each point in our periodic point set. And we want to observe or, or calculate, compute, um, how these growing balls cover a unit cell. So um, to help you understand this on the left image, the radius of balls are um, 0.25, uh, the left middle they're 0.55, the right middle they're 0.75, and the right one they're of radius one. So they're growing balls and you can see that our unit cell, um, which is this or the interior of this square here, um, initially is not covered by, or is predominantly not covered by any balls, and it starts to uh, become covered by one ball. And then um, you can see that these balls intersect and these green regions emerge, and the balls are covered by two balls. And then um, as we keep on growing the balls, we can see orange and red regions emerge, uh, which represent regions of our unit cell covered by um, three balls and four balls, respectively. And we can take all of this information and we can put it um, into a plot. So here's the first uh, eight density functions um, of the square, of the unit square lattice. And we can see that, um, well, initially they all start at zero and the first density function increases because um, it's a square, Lattice is going to simply be pi r squared. Um, at 0 0.5, we see the, um, which is the half length of one of these edges. We see um, the second density function starting to increase, and indeed the first density function starts to decrease. At um, here, this is a root 2 over 2, so half the length of the diagonal. Um, we see the third and fourth density functions starting to increase. Um, and so on. And this is something that I've been uh, working on, um, which is a um, invariant of crystal structures and has helped us to, um, has already helped us um, in applications to um, things like crystal structure prediction and um, analyzing the Cambridge uh, structural database. 
Um, but what I want to be talking on, particularly in this talk, is um, these higher in-depth foreign noise zones and how these relate to density functions is that, um, well, it's all tied up really in this equation, but um, effectively we use higher in-depth foreign noise zones to compute our density functions. So um, what basically what this equation is saying that if we want to compute, for example, let's say the second density function of the square lattice at radius t, um, this equation is saying that all we need to do is we need to take a ball centered at a lattice point um, of radius t, and we need to intersect it with um, well, this blue region here, which hopefully you can make out. And um, that, which I'll come on to explain, that is um, our second Voronoi zone um, of the central point P in the square lattice. Um, and so if we can compute these Voronoi zones, we can compute our density functions um, and use that to, um, as our invariant or an invariant for crystal structures. So let me let me introduce um, our Voronoi zones, and as you can probably guess, these are very much related to Voronoi domains, um, which you may or may not know about. Um, so let me start by explaining what a Voronoi domain is. So if we have a point set C, and again I'm going to be using the square lattice um, for simplicity. Um, well, if we take a point P in our point set, so here's our point P, then the Voronoi domain of P, uh, which we denote VCP, is the uh, closure of the set of points in the ambient space that are closer to P than any other point um, in our point set C. So effectively, this blue region here is going to be our Voronoi domain um, for this point P. And you can actually, you can see, um, this is obtained simply, simply by taking the um, bisectors between our point P and all the other um, points in our point set. Um, and you can in fact see um, from this image the Voronoi domains of all the other points that are shown here of the square lattice. And one thing to take away from this is we can see that um, the Voronoi domains tile uh, the ambient space, the plane um, in the 2D case. Now, as you may be able to imagine, um, Voronoi domains can eas easily be extended. Um, so here we've extended it to, um, or we can extend it to the kth Voronoi domain. So again, if we have our point set C and the point P from it, as we have here, then the kth Voronoi domain of P is the closure of the set of points in our, in our ambient space that have P amongst its K closest points of C. So effectively, if we want the second Voronoi domain of our central point P, we need to um, include in that uh, domain, the first Voronoi domain, the regular Voronoi domain of P, which is that square. Um, but also we're going to need to include what are well, these these sort of four triangles. So if we look at the right-hand triangle, we see that any point in the interior of this right-hand triangle has um, this right point here as its closest point, then it has our point P as its second closest point um, amongst all points in our point set. And so it's in the second Voronoi domain um, of, our, of our central point P. And we can keep going, K can go on forever really, that's the third um, Voronoi domain of our central point P. Now the K Voronoi zone, um, which is what we're interested in, is um, can be obtained simply by subtracting from the K Voronoi domain, the K minus one Voronoi domain. So if we want the second Voronoi zone, of our central point P, we just need to have our second um, Voronoi domain. We need to subtract the uh, regular Voronoi domain, the first Voronoi domain, 
from it. And the remaining, uh, remaining region, which is uh, the blue region that you can see, is the, is the second uh, Voronoi zone of our central point P. Um, now, again, uh, interestingly, um, just like our regular Voronoi domains, any or well, the set of Kth Voronoi zones um, can also be used to tile um, to tile the ambient space. So here we've got, if you see these blue regions, that's the second Voronoi zone of our central point P. But I've also included all the other um, Voronoi zones or second Voronoi zones of all the other points that are shown. We can see how it tiles the plane, which makes sense because um, any point in our ambient space is going to have, um, uh, as far as if any point in the interior of one of these triangles is going to have um, a unique point of our point set as its second closest um, point in the point set. Um, as I as I was saying, you can we can take this key and we can um, keep this this k and we can keep on going um, higher and higher. So there's a third Voronoi zone um, for our point set, and um, here's the first thirty um, Voronoi zones of this central point P um, for the unit square lattice. And you can see that it quickly, um, as we increase k, it quickly um, gets more complicated. Um, and the number of sort of polygons that make up each zone increases as well. Um, so that's our Voronoi zones. And um, as I've kind of already said already, we can use our Voronoi zones um, to characterize the relative positions of potentially distant atoms, and so not just neighboring atoms, um, in a crystal from a fit center. And as I've mentioned, we can use our Voronoi zones in the computations of, of density functions, which is one of our um, crystal invariants um, using this equation. The um, Voronoi zones have a couple of uh, nice properties. Um, so one is that well, if we just start, for, start with a lattice, um, the volume of each Kth Voronoi zone is the same. So that's saying that um, the volume of the first Voronoi zone in this case, which would be one because it's the um, unit square, um, is the same as the sum of the volumes of all these uh, tiny little polygons that make up the 30th uh, Voronoi zone of our central point. Central point in the middle. Um, and you can see that perhaps because of the fact that each Voronoi zone, each kth Voronoi zone does tile um, the plane. And this, this fact is also true for periodic sets. So points, um, point sets that have more than one point in their motive, or at least one point in their motive, um, if we sum over the motive points. And, um, more than that is that, um, in fact, any integrable function with the same periodicity um, as our periodic point set um, will also be constant um, as we go as we uh, iterate through kth Voronoi zones, and that fact can be um, hopefully seen from uh, these six six pictures, which show that. Um, well, if, we focus, if we focus on the top row, we see here the uh, what is this red and blue zone combined to make the Voronoi domain of the lattice. And we can see that um, the Voronoi domain of our red point in our periodic point set and the Voronoi domain of our blue point in our periodic point set um, can also be combined to make the Voronoi domain of a lattice, um, which probably makes sense. But if we um, start looking at our second Voronoi zone, um, so if we look at on the left here, we've got the second Voronoi zone in red um, of our red lattice, red point in our periodic point set. And on the right, we've got our second Voronoi zone of our blue point 
in that period at points set sat these four um, polygons here. And um, there's a theorem that says that there exists a, a piecewise um, a, tr a function that translates piecewise um, these four regions into the Voronoid domain of our lattice. And the existence of this bijection means that um, our k Voronoi zones um, have the same value for any um, integrable or any integrable function with the same periodicity it remains unchanged regardless of the value of our k um, of our k Voronoi zone. So that's one interesting property of Voronoi zones. Another, um, which is a bit more um, intuitive, I guess, is that um, each k Voronoi zone with its boundary, so the closure of each k Voronoi zone, um, can be mapped surjectively onto the sphere surrounding the central point. So here we've got a, a, a two point or a periodic set, periodic set with two points in its motive. And we can see that the second Voronoi zone of our central point P um, sort of completely surrounds the point, so to speak. It can be mapped surjectively onto a, onto a sphere surrounding P. And that fact is true for regardless of the case. So you can see that all of these Voronoi zones, as we increase K, um, all completely surround our central point P. Um, so there's a couple of nice properties about Voronoi zones. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the algorithm that we've come up with to um, compute our Voronoi zones. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about now. So just starting with the very um, basic facts of the inputs and outputs of our algorithm. Um, our algorithm only works in dimensions n less than or equal to three, and it takes us input um, n basis vectors that define a lattice. Um, and it also takes a motif um, m um, within this the unit cell defined by the basis vectors. And I want to remind you that m can have more than one point. It's not necessarily a lattice. It can be a periodic point set. And we take an index k. And then the algorithm is going to output a union of cons convex polytopes um, for each index i, where i ranges from 1 to k. And that union of convex polytopes is going to be our um, well, ith Voronoi zone. So what, what I'm saying here is that the output is going to be the first, it's going to be all the Voronoi zones up to and including k. So we don't just compute the k Voronoi zone, but we compute the k minus one and so on. And um, so what we do is we're gonna, we're gonna find a, um, a finite set of points that are gonna uh, be crucial to computing our Voronoi zones. And then we're gonna loop over each point. And I'm gonna start by telling you about this main loop and then talk about how we find um, the finite set of points that make up this loop. Um, so the main loop is that um, we're going to loop over our points with increasing distance from the origin. And what we do, this will be sort of the existing structure. We're going to um, add our next point, um, P, into our structure. And then we take the bisector um, between P and our central point, which we denote by the origin. And this bisector is, is going to intersect some existing uh, polygons, um, if, if we're using a 2D example. And what we do, we find the intersections, we then split our poly polygons in two, and then the index, um, the sort of Voronoi zone index of the polygon closest to the origin that remains the same, and the Voronoi index of the polygon further away from the origin increases by one. 
And we sort of keep on doing that over all of the points that we need to consider. And the output will be um, our Voronoi zones that we desire. Um, so in terms of working out the points we need to consider in this algorithm, um, I want to stress the fact that we, we need the Minkowski reduced basis, um, which is, and if we don't have a Minkowski reduced basis, that's the first step of our algorithm is to uh, convert the basis into a Minkowski reduced one. Um, and the reason for that is that if a unit cell U is not reduced, then its extension by any uh, fits factor K may not cover even the first Voronoi zone. So uh, by extension, what I mean is that if you can see here, this sort of top right quadrant of this shape, that's going to be our unit cell. But if we wanted to extend that to, um, or if we want the two extension of this unit cell, that would be um, this larger orange region. And uh, an issue that we have is that um, if our unit cell is not reduced, as in our bottom case here, um, for um, its extension by any fits factor K uh, may not cover um, even the first four I'm saying. So in this example here, we've got the square lattice, this blue square is our unit cell, or let me correct that, it's our Voronoi zone of our lattice. But if our unit cell is um, one of these yellow um, parallel parallelograms, then even the four extension in this case of the unit cell um, will not cover the Voronoi domain. And um, let there exist even worse examples where uh, this sort of co coefficient will have to be higher and higher for us to cover um, our Voronoi domain. Um, and so that's so if we have a Minkowski reduced basis, this sort of solves the problem. Um, and the reason is that um, that's where this lemma comes in. So if our dimension n is less than or equal to three and we have a Lattice, and this is also true for um, periodic point sets. Um, and if its unit cell is generated by a Minkowski reduced basis, um, then the 2K extended unit cell, so sym symmetrically extended around the origin, covers the K Voronoi zone, said K lambda zero. So that statement means that we can restrict the points that we consider in our algorithm to a finite set um, that we can then run through that main loop. Um, so it's quite a crucial lemma. And the outline of the proof is that, um, well, if we let lambda subscript i be all uh, lattice points in our lattice that are on the boundary of our 2i extended unit cell, um, it can be shown and um, there's a paper that does this, but I'm not going to go into that here, that any point outside of the 2i extended unit cell is closer to a point of lambda i than to zero. And that means, hence, any point outside of the 2k extended unit cell is closer to at least k distinct points um, of our lattice lambda not including zero than to zero, which means that it's not in our Kth Voronoi zone um, of zero in our lattice, which means that the um, 2K extended unit cell covers the Kth Voronoi zone. So that's how we can restrict ourselves, even though we're dealing with periodic point sets. Um, this is how we can restrict our algorithm to just a finite set of points when computing our Kth Voronoi zones. Um, a little bit about the complexity of the algorithm. Um, so what we did, we took a, um, a selection of periodic point sets um, with, uh, well, yeah, uh, we made ourselves a data set of periodic point sets and um, we used it to um, sort of 
analyze our algorithm um, and so this is a bit about the runtime and you can see here is that as we um, increase the, the index k um, of our Voronoi zones, the runtime um, in, does increase polynomially, um, which is what you would expect. Um, these are for 2D examples, by the way, but the, um, the results are similar uh, to an extent in 3D. Um, the bottom one shows that if we increase the uh, number m of motive points in our in the unit cell of our periodic point set, then uh, the runtime increases roughly linearly, um, which we're quite pleased with um, as well. Um, here's some other just interesting uh, things I wanted to show you about the analysis of our outputs, and that is. Um, so on the bottom here, we've got the, we're increasing the index K of Voronoi zone. So we're going sort of out in layers. Um, and on the Y axis, we've got the number of polygons that are sort of making up our K Voronoi zone. And we see that um, as K increases, our number of polygons increases um, pretty linearly, um, which is um, quite interesting. It's the same, same scenario for vertices as well and then this uh, right picture on the x-axis we've got the uh, number um, of motive points in the unit cell of our periodic point set and on the y-axis we've got again a number of polygons um, that are making up uh, the first k uh, Voronoi zones of our periodic point set and interestingly we see that um, for small numbers of M, this increases quite rapidly, but then plateaus so that increase in the uh, number M of motive points um, has no real effect on the number of polygons in the first, I believe in this case, the first eight uh, Voronoi zones of our periodic, of a point in our periodic point set. Um, I've got here just some um, little animations, um, which I'm hoping will work. Yeah. Um, so these are showing uh, 3D Voronoi zones. In each one, it's the fifth Voronoi zone. Um, they're all of uh, lattices. So the top one is. Uh, uh, base centered qubit lattice, the middle one is a face centered qubit lattice, and the bottom one, which you can see is a bit more um, regular, is, is the fifth Voronoi zone of the qubit lattice. Um, so that's just sort of a, an example output um, of the kth Voronoi zone of a 3D. Um, in, the, in these cases, lattice, but you could do the same for periodic point sets. Um, so this is a summary of our uh, Voronoi zones. So higher index Voronoi zones characterize relative positions of points um, in a periodic point set. Uh, they can be used to compute crystal invariants um, such as density functions. And if you want me to talk a little bit more about density functions, I've got a few slides um, on that. Um, if you'd like to hear more about that, um, but these density functions we've um, um, we've used as crystal invariants to help, um, yeah, to help analyze crystals and compare crystals, which we hope will have applications in uh, crystal structure prediction. And it is the Voronoi zones I've been talking about that um, we use to compute these density functions. Um, the C plus C plus plus code. Um, that I've uh, written for the algorithm can be found here, um, if that's of interest to anyone. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna, I do have some slides on density functions if you'd like to hear that, but I'll finish there for the moment. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Phil. Let us thank Phil first. So please unmute yourself and clap or uh, Put your hands virtually. So th thank you.
let me stop uh, the recording.